This new unit is about electricity and magnetism. This first lesson is about the electrostatic force. We're going to start off with a little bit of review about the parts of the atom. Some of this you'll already know, and some of this will be new. What should definitely not be new to you are the three basic parts of the atom. All atoms in the universe are made up of protons and neutrons, which exist inside the nucleus of the atoms, and electrons, which exist outside of the nucleus. There are two basic properties of these particles that we need to be familiar with. The first is mass. Just like any other mass we've talked about in this course, the mass of these particles is measured in kilograms. Since you already know something about these particles, you won't be surprised to see how tiny the masses are. The proton and the neutron are both 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. That's about a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a kilogram. The electron, as you know, is even smaller. 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. You can find all of these numbers on the first page of your reference tables. The other important property of these particles that we need to be familiar with is charge. One way to identify the charge of an object is to describe how many elementary charges it is composed of. Elementary here, like elementary school or elementary, my dear Watson, means basic, most basic in fact. The elementary charge is the smallest individual charge that can exist in the universe. Last year, and before that, if you described the proton as positive one, what you meant was positive one elementary charge. Neutrons, as you know, are neutral, we can call that zero, and electrons you've called negative one. And again, when you said an electron was negative one, you meant it was negative one elementary charge. There will be plenty of situations where we describe the charge of the proton and the electron as simply positive or negative. Sometimes we'll include a little more information by describing them as positive one or negative one, just like you've done before. However, if we're ever going to use the charge of the proton or the electron in an equation, we cannot use positive one or negative one. Elementary charge is a description of how much charge there is. It's a comparison. It isn't a unit. The unit that we'll use for charge in this course is the Coulomb. This is named after a French physicist whose name I can't properly pronounce. One elementary charge is equivalent to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. This means that a proton is positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. A neutron is still just zero coulombs, it's neutral and an electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Again, if we ever need to use the charge of a proton or an electron in a calculation, we have to use the charge of these particles in coulombs. We cannot simply use plus one and minus one. The next thing we should discuss is the charge on an object. We're gonna start this with a couple of basic facts. First of all, Atoms are normally neutral, that is, they have the same number of protons and electrons. Another really basic fact is that all macroscopic objects are made of atoms. Macroscopic is the opposite of microscopic. Microscopic objects are things that you cannot see with the naked eye. Macroscopic objects are things you can see with the naked eye, so look around. Anything you can see is macroscopic, and all of those things are made of atoms. If we take these two basic facts together, we should be able to say that all macroscopic objects are normally neutral. The universe would be a pretty boring place if everything was always neutral, however. Objects can become charged. And there are two really fundamental ways that this can happen. An object can gain electrons to become negatively charged, or it can lose electrons to become positively charged. There is no other way for an object to become charged. Atoms cannot gain or lose protons. Since the charge on an object depends on how many electrons it gained or lost, the charge of an object must be a multiple of the charge of an electron. That is, it has to be a multiple of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Let's take a look at a couple examples. Let's say that a balloon was rubbed against someone's hair 
and the balloon gained 9 electrons. What's the charge of that balloon going to be in coulombs? Well, this is the perfect situation to use a proportion. Well, we know that one elementary charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. In this problem, we're dealing with nine elementary charges because the balloon is gaining nine electrons. How many coulombs is that equivalent to? Well, in this case, all we have to do is cross multiply, and we'll find that nine elementary charges is equivalent to 1.44 times 10 to the negative 18 coulombs. When we talk about the charge of an object, we should state the sign of the charge in addition to the magnitude. Since this balloon gained 9 electrons, it must actually have a negative charge. Here's another example. A metal sphere has a charge of positive 4.8 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. First, did it gain or lose electrons? And how many? Well, if we take a look at the sign of the charge, we can see that it's positive. If an object is positive, that means it has more protons than it has electrons. The only way for that to happen is for the object to lose electrons. Once again, we'll set up a proportion to figure out how many electrons it lost. So one elementary charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. We want to know how many elementary charges 4.8 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs is equivalent to. If we cross multiply and divide, we find out that this is equivalent to three elementary charges and therefore three electrons lost. The next thing we want to look at is the interaction of charged particles. We'll start by discussing attraction and repulsion. So this picture shows two objects that each have a net positive charge. You should already know how these two particles should interact. Two objects with positive charge should feel force away from each other, and if they were free to move, they would actually repel. Here are two other objects. Each of these has a net negative charge. This means that each of them must have gained electrons. Just like the two positive objects, these two negative objects will also feel a repulsive force, and if they were free to move, they too would repel from each other. Finally, we could take a look at an object with a net positive charge and an object with a net negative charge. These two objects will feel an attractive force between them. If they were free to move, they would attract each other. To summarize this, like charges repel and opposite charges attract. The strength of this attraction or repulsion is determined by Coulomb's law. This is an equation that allows us to calculate the strength of the electrostatic force. Coulomb's law states that the force between two charged particles is directly proportional to the magnitude of the charges of the particles. So here we have two objects one is negative one elementary charge and one is negative two elementary charges and since they have the same charge these two objects will repel each other however if we had two other objects of negative eight elementary charges and negative nine elementary charges these will also repel but since they have more charge they will repel more strongly before we move on i want to note that in each of these cases both objects experience the same amount of force. This is Newton's third law. When two objects interact, they feel forces that are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Coulomb's law also states that the force between two charged particles is inversely proportional to the distance between the particles. So here we have those same negative eight and negative nine elementary charge particles and when they're close, they'll feel a very strong repulsive force. However, if we move them farther away, the repulsive force that they experience will be much smaller. We can put these two relationships together with a constant to form an equation. This is the equation known as Coulomb's Law. Fe equals k q1 q2 over r squared. Fe 
stands for electrostatic force. Just like every other force we've learned about this entire year, the electrostatic force is measured in newtons. K is the electrostatic constant. It is equal to 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Just like every other constant, you can find this on the first page of your reference tables. Lowercase q is the abbreviation for charge. q1 and q2 in the equation refer to the charges of object 1 and object 2. And r stands for the distance between the centers of the objects. This is just like the r in the universal law of gravity. Let's look at some examples using Coulomb's law. Here we have two objects, one with a charge of positive 6 coulombs and one with a charge of positive 3 coulombs, and they're 12 meters apart. My question is, how much electrostatic force do they feel? Well, we start off with Coulomb's law, and we can plug in all of our givens, the constant from the reference table, the 6 coulombs and the 3 coulombs, and the 12 meters, which of course we square. When we carefully plug these numbers into our calculator, we find out that the electrostatic force between these two particles is 1.12 times 10 to the 9 newtons. Try it yourself and make sure you get the same answer as me. What the equation doesn't make clear is whether this force is attractive or repulsive. But that's fine, we don't need the equation to tell us that. Look at the two objects, they're both positively charged. Are these two objects going to attract or repel? Well, they are like charges, so they will repel. Here's another example. One object has a charge of positive 7 coulombs, and the other object has a charge of negative 4 coulombs, and these two objects are 0.25 meters apart. Once again, I want us to calculate how much electrostatic force each of them will experience. We'll go through the same process. We start off with the equation for Coulomb's law, and then we can plug in all of our givens. There's something really important I want to point out here. You'll notice I did not plug in positive 7. I mean, you don't really have to plug in a positive anyway. But more importantly, I didn't plug in a negative 4 coulombs. The positive and negative that we use to describe the different types of charge don't have the same mathematical connotations they usually do. In fact, instead of calling them positive and negative, we could have called the two different types of charge red and blue, or happy and sad. If an object had more happy charges than sad charges, it would have a net happy charge. If it had more sad charges than happy charges, it would have a net sad charge. Two objects with a net happy charge would repel, as would two objects with a net sad charge. An object with a happy charge and an object with a sad charge would attract each other. I know that's silly, but I'm really trying to make the point that when you use these charges in an equation, you don't need to include the positive and the negative. In fact, I think if you do, it might be more confusing than it is helpful. Let's finish off this equation, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. When we plug these numbers carefully into our calculator, we'll find that the electrostatic force between these two particles is 4.03 times 10 to the 12 newtons. That is the magnitude of the force that each of these particles will feel. Since force is a vector, we might also want to describe the direction. Here's where the positive and negative come in. Looking at these two objects, one's positive and one is negative, so we can say that the positive 7 coulomb charge will feel that force to the right, and the negative 4 coulomb charge will feel that force to the left. We don't need to include the positive and negative sign into the equation to come to that conclusion. We can discuss this more in class if we need to.